everyone. Welcome back to the Earth Dawn Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters, and the questers that are Josh and Dan. I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things omnidirectional because we're going to talk about the journeyman. How'd you like that? Yeah. One? I pulled that one out of nowhere. Okay. <laughs> sure. Or somewhere. We'll go with anyway. that. Omni. Yes. 90 episodes in, they can't all be winners. No, no. In fact, I would imagine that people would email us uh, if we had a, a poll and say that most of them are not winners. I would say that. But you're still hanging around for them, and you're still kind of appreciating them when I get there. 90 in. 90 episodes. That means yeah. that, hold on, let me let me look at my calendar here real quick. Counting so down to the see. big C note. This episode is going to go live October 6th. Mm-hmm. So our episode 100 will actually be shortly before Christmas, according to my quick oh, look wow. at the calendar here. Episode 100 will be dropping December 15th. If everything goes well. episodes <laughs> will be a little bit past our two-year anniversary at that point. In fact, well, we're and, coming up on our two-year anniversary, our actual date two-year anniversary yes. here. Yes. Yeah, that's... Actually, this episode, I think, is effectively our two-year anniversary episode. I thought it was October, but I'm... Yeah, we'll have to look at it. This episode, we're not recording it in October, but this oh, episode right, is, right, should right. be dropping be... October 6th. Well, happy anniversary to us. <laughs> happy anniversary to us. Speaking of the subject matter, just going yeah. in many directions. Yes. Episode one dropped October 9th nice. of 2019. Mm-hmm. This episode will drop October 6th of 2021. So, yeah. We've been around as long as COVID. Just about as close to two years as you can with the way the calendars work. Yeah, we've been around just a little bit longer than COVID. Not a great comparison, I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank yes. you, everyone, for yes. sticking with us. Actually, yeah, since since this turns out, as we just discovered, <laughs> going to be a, a, an anniversary episode, let's talk some... Oh, let's do it. ...numbers real briefly. This is as of... September 22nd, 2021. So a couple of weeks before the actual anniversary. But this yeah, is the yeah. episode that's going live around there. So we'll talk about these numbers right now. It works. As of right now, according to the information available through our podcast host at anchor.fm, which is serving us well, continuing to serve us well, mm-hmm. we have no complaints. 33,968 plays. Uh, that's basically plays. downloads slash listens. The number of times your podcast episodes have been streamed or downloaded across all listening platforms that Anchor tracks. Download can either represent an automatic download or someone actually listening. So that might not be how many times people have actually listened to them, you know, because I know we've got people who are subscribed and might have episodes that are downloading but aren't getting caught up in things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still want a penny for every play, though. (laughs) Ain't going to happen, but I want it. Well, that's maybe something we can explore in the future. Ah, No worries. Then a couple of other stats that we have handy are our estimated audience and our unique listens. As Mm. of today, the last seven days, the number of distinct devices based on IP address as read by various things. Yeah, services. In the past week, 275 unique listeners, which is respectable. Yeah. And an estimated audience... Of 161. And that's based on the average number of plays each of our episodes gets within 30 days of it going live. So some of you are double dipping and listening to us twice in the same month. I'm teasing. I don't know. (laughs) No, no, no. So yeah, but basically what it, what it's because Anchor does kind of multiple platforms and different platforms handle things in different ways. Totally. Audience size. This is the average number of times that new episodes get listened to within a month of them going up. Hmm. Okay. That's considered your your average audience. Like more people might listen, but these are the people that that like the about the number of people that listen every week. Gotcha. That's pretty good. I mean, small, that's fine, but we are a niche topic. Yeah. We're a niche game. You know, a niche a niche topic for a niche game. I think that's cool. I still think 275 is bigger than my high school graduating class. So <laughs> it's bigger than mine. My high school graduating <laughs> class was like about a hundred and 2530. Yeah. Our biggest week of listens, we've got a little graph that shows mm-hmm. the listens on a sort of weekly basis. Yeah. 
by a rather significant margin uh, was the week of December 23rd to 29th of 2020, so this past Christmas. And part (laughs) of that is very heavily driven by the fact that on Christmas of last year, I dropped the five-part actual play that I ran for The Crit Show back in now a year and a half ago, back in April of of 2020. Mm -hmm. But that was a big thing. But the the graph has sort of steadily been climbing with some some dips. Obviously, there's a big dip in November of 2020 um, for reasons that I talked about back then, where we kind of took some time off. Had a hiatus. A little hiatus and and some 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 episodes not picking up, you know, not driving traffic as much as others. Yeah, the Legends episodes, I don't even care how they did. They were there for filler. Hope you all enjoyed them. Yeah. Moving on. The other big episode was actually our our episode, episode 38, mm. talking about attitudes and favors and uh, Game Master and like the social systems. I had a feeling that would go over quite well. Like if we look at the graph, that week is the second highest spike on our graph in terms of listenership. Yeah. I saw, I think our most popular episode is still episode one because people like to start at the beginning. Well, yeah. Like if we, I mean, if <laughs> we're going to talk out. about like sheer numbers of plays. Yeah. Our first episode is the largest. As of right now, it has 868 plays. Wow. But it's also the first episode. It's the one that's been up the longest. Now, obviously, the further along you go. But typically, yeah. like we tend to see if I go back and look, like kind of keep track of those numbers, we do get about 100 downloads slash listens for a new episode that within a day or two of it going live. That's not nothing. Our audience Mm -hmm. is pretty diverse in terms of where they're from. Oh yeah. Geography. A little bit more than half, 56% of our audience is from the U S the next highest chunk is from Germany with 13%. And then we've got, um, Canada and the UK, uh, tied sort of in for third there, Australia, Sweden, Poland, Norway, and Denmark, all with 1% or greater. And then at that point, we drop down into less than 1%, but we've got such countries in that list as Kenya, <laughs> Hungary, <laughs> Brazil, Argentina, Puerto Rico, New Zealand, Qatar, Romania, South Africa, like you know, U.S. minor outlying islands, uh, Switzerland. I want to quote. I want to quote ZZ Top on Bad Em Nationwide, but this is global. So, about a third of our downloads come go through Spotify, which makes sense. Um, Anchor FM is actually affiliated with Spotify. Uh, yeah. Apple Podcasts is at twenty two percent, and then we've got Podcast Addict, uh, which is actually what I use for my podcast listening, mm-hmm. and Anchor itself. Um, and then there's the other, which is like, thir- which is actually 34%, the, the majority. Yeah. Any way you can get us is fine. Anyway, so those are some numbers and, and we thank everybody for uh, helping make those numbers what they are. And we hope you continue to stick with us and enjoy what we do, because at least for the time being, we are planning to continue. Uh, we've yeah. got a couple of, um, we've got uh, uh, a special thing that is in the works that will be coming up down the road here in a little bit the details still need to be hashed out so i won't get into that right now yeah but if you recall we did have a sort of special episode 50 with kyle Mm -hmm. i'm planning another sort of special episode and um i'll just say i think people will be surprised i know they'll be surprised but let's let one cat out of the bag it's not going to be an interview with lou it is not we we (laughs) may do an interview with lou at some point We've talked about how yeah. there have been several interviews with Lou kind of done in, in the last couple of years or so, yeah. and we would want to kind of take a different approach, find something kind of fresh and and a, and a different take in terms of talking to Lou and not necessarily go through the same how he got involved and, and the asked. same, yeah, the same dozen questions or so. So no, no, no prosperical episode coming anytime soon. And not that's currently planned, no. Not that's currently planned. And we also are not, by the way, doing reverse psychology and teasing you, and therefore, poof, Lou will be here. We honestly mean no interviews with Lou. We've not talked about it. Love you, Lou. But, you know, we got to figure out our, our own EDSG take on how to, how to interview Lou for a new, for, in a new way for this audience. So, Much like my approach to 
<laughs> adapting earlier content for fourth edition, I got to figure out what kind of value added stuff we can put in to make it worth the effort. There you go. Make it worthwhile. That's 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 the spin on that one. We'll go with that. So thank you again for being on this journey with us. And that is my segue to talk about the human only path of the journeyman and its evolution from first edition to fourth edition. So Josh, what was kind of the evolution? I mean, we all know the evolution from those disciplines into paths, but this is the only human discipline. Yes. From the original set. And so the evolution on, I know creating into a path is one thing, but it had like 10 circles before and, a, you know, it was basically just. Yeah. So yeah, let's pick, run through that. Yeah. The journeyman was originally introduced in Denizens of Earth on volume one for first edition. It is the human or it was the human racial discipline. The idea being that it leverages the human racial trait of versatility. Yes. And basically becomes a build your own discipline kind of thing. Humans yeah, I, in first edition get versatility as a racial talent that they may take advantage of by buying ranks in versatility. It allowed them to learn talents from other disciplines to sort of expand the repertoire and abilities that they had. It was a little bit of a legend point sink. It still is a little bit of a legend point sink. Oh, there yes. have been some issues in the past with versatility and its effect on game balance. One of the things that is a massive headache in some regards when it comes to building disciplines and building unique talents and things like that is the understanding that a human with versatility could potentially learn it. And therefore, we would need to think of the interactions of how it might combine with any other talent available to any other discipline in the game rather than them being siloed off. This is part of the reason why some of the more interesting and potentially game-breaking abilities mm -hmm. uh, that are available to paths are gated behind knacks because you can't learn knacks under talents that you have through versatility. So it prevents those from being quite as widely available and makes them a little bit more special. I just heard 250 people go, oh, yeah. Little little bit of design insight there for you <laughs> folks. The journeyman discipline in first edition and the later iterations of that, uh, I don't know whether they actually officially released one for second edition, but also for third edition. Mm -hmm. Rather than just getting one versatility talent, actually got two versatility talents. The reason for this being that one versatility talent on its own would not have enough slots potentially under it in order to really fuel an equivalent discipline build that you would get to other disciplines. Yeah. It also saves a little bit on the legend point cost because you can get two versatility talents each at rank one for the equivalent of 200 legend points, mm -hmm. whereas to get rank two is a total of 300. And so you can kind of rank those up alongside each other. Mm -hmm. and not have quite as much legend that you're spending. And so a original flavor journeyman for their eight starting talent ranks that mm -hmm. they get at character creation. Yeah. Four points of those would go into versatility for two two versatilities at two ranks each. There there's half mm -hmm. your starting points right as the allotment. Yeah. And then you get the four remaining ranks to buy four additional talents. Because you've got four slots in versatility, you can have four talents under them, and each of those would have one. Yeah. And then, as your character advanced as a journeyman, you would need to raise your versatility, and then, as in addition, raise your other talents and learn new talents. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, a journeyman actually was a little bit more legend point intensive to advance. It cost more legend to reach an equivalent circle than you would in another discipline, in part because the versatility talents themselves would not count towards the adept's ability to advance. Yeah. It's already just something a whole lot complicated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> The journeyman would have their pick of whatever talents they wanted to learn mm -hmm. from any disciplines, provided they could find somebody willing to teach them, and potentially had the ability to put together some, some broken combinations. Yeah. The journeyman discipline did not lend itself particularly well to spellcasting because of how many different pieces were required 
to be a spellcaster. Mm-hmm. You, know, you get spellcasting, thread weaving, matrices, a matrix, and read write magic, like yeah. in fourth edition. That there's your starting sort of allotment of four slots. You get mm-hmm. one matrix, and you have the downside also that the old school journeyman had some restrictions in terms of its karma use. They didn't, as they advanced in circles, they could select one of the talents they knew to be a disciplined talent, therefore the ability to spend karma on it. Mm -hmm. But in general, it was a weird, funky discipline that could potentially be broken if you got the right combination of stuff, but was a little bit more expensive, legend point wise, and just like really interesting, like an interesting idea. Now, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, in more depth, at least in the fourth edition version of it. But the primary reason that people would go after journeymen quite frequently was the unique talent that they got called morphism, playing off of the idea that humans as the sort of baseline stock of the various name giver races, a human journeyman adept could leverage that magical connection to increase yeah. and provide bonuses to their attributes based on the attribute bonuses available to other races. Mm-hmm. And that bonus would be based on their rank in the morphism talent. Like they would get a plus one at, at rank one, a plus like kind of going we'll up get from there. there until they were at the highest ranks, they would get the highest bonuses available to each of the attributes so you would get like the plus six strength from obsidian men and mm-hmm. the plus four toughness and then the the plus one bonuses to all of your mental stats and all of that yeah really really like powerful kind of high circle i think it was a, a circle nine was where it became available that was the main reason that people would look at at getting journeyman was to be able to get a talent that kind of cheesed your attribute values um above and beyond the normal limits of raising them the traditional way. Yeah. And there was um, not much really that changed in the basic structure of the journeyman through the prior editions until we get to fourth edition where it was adapted as a path. And that is where we find ourselves today. Yes, you're, you are correct. Um, original edition in the Denison's book says, uh, morphism at ninth circle. I've always had a a couple of people approach my game, my game. And they're like, yeah, the disciplines were fun. And this is before fourth edition, of course. So I'm going to go back in time a little bit before fourth edition. There was approach. They would always come to my game. Yeah, this is, you know, the, the warrior is kind of cool, but not exactly what I'm looking for. Or the spellcaster is kind of cool, but not exactly what I'm looking for. You know, can I, can I hodgepodge these two things together? I'm kind of like, well, then you're looking for a journeyman because that way you can just grab what you want and play exactly what you're looking for. That's the best ex- explanation I can give people for what it was back then. Yeah, certainly. Obviously, you know, with with fourth edition and the more open talent selection that you can have, there's less of a need, I think, for that so much, which is part of why the path version of Journeyman, I think, works better in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is a certain amount of system mastery that is rewarded with the Journeyman. If you know what you're looking for and there are particular talents and you've got a particular combo that you're trying to build, then – that knowledge of the various moving parts can be really handy. I had a journeyman in uh, adept in my first long-term came campaign. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The stories of which used to be available on my website, and I may eventually get them back up there at some point. <laughs> the riders on the storm bear claw. Yeah. Who I don't think actually appears in any of the examples in the fourth edition player's guide, because as a journeyman, mm-hmm. he's not an adept that's described in there. And I can't really do anything with that. Yeah. Um, but Bear Claw was a journeyman and started off with claw shape, air dance, unarmed combat, and I don't remember what his fourth talent was mm-hmm. off the top of my head. Tracking, maybe? Could like be. he was sort of a pseudo beast mastery kind of thing without all of the animal associated talents. Yeah. He didn't get played for particularly long. The character actually ended up sacrificing himself because the player wasn't particularly happy with the discipline after mm-hmm. a little bit yeah. and retired bear claw in favor of dora who was a, a sky raider hmm. dora who does appear in the examples of the fourth edition player's guide yeah very nice so i think the original incarnation of the journeyman was the jack of all trades master of none um kind of, you know, grab what you want to or fill in what the party needs. You know, it's kind of like the Swiss army knife. It'll do everything. (laughs) 
a little bit here and there. Um, whereas now this is more R O L E playing behind the journeyman that I appreciate for this path, which is that, um, now every journeyer, journeyman, journey woman, take your pick. Every journeyer is individualized more so than just a list of talent options you want to pick and choose from. This is more of a, you're there to experience life and you're there to experience the, the, the things that you observe and the things that you experience and take what you can from those a little bit here and there, learn this talent from this person you've encountered, learn this talent from this person you're hanging around with, or, you know, go into a town and go, you know what, I've needed to learn this and go get that. Or this would have been really handy. Go get that as well. Right. One of those things. So there's more story behind it than just, Hey, it's a list of, you know, go grab whatever you want and fill in because you're, you know, the thing about the the philosophy of the journeyman that is described in the essay in Mystic Paths is that it takes the notion of versatility, that is the ability of the humans to more easily pick up magical abilities and tricks from other disciplines and leverages that into a philosophy that is based around the idea of learning and diversifying one's abilities and knowledge mm -hmm. as much as possible. Yeah. Dedicating themselves philosophically to the idea and how that approach is different from a character who follows multiple disciplines like that, yes. that, like there's a very different approach there that the journeyman still learns a little bit of the philosophy of the discipline that they're picking up a new talent from, because that's how they learn that and, and unlock it. But there's a particular quirk to their magic that allows them to do that without the dedicated focus. The lack of focus is mm -hmm. the sort of short circuiting or, or end run that they make around the traditional requirements of magic yes. that by their very focused lack of focus. Agreed. It's, it's the, ins it's, it's the insatiable curiosity about I mean, because what I've said before, you know, focus is where power comes from. Theirs is the, when I was starting out in a career, it was, uh, or just right after high school into college, there was always, always like, um, well, pick your major and that's what you're going to go for. Or you can just kind of pick and choose your classes and have a broad base of knowledge. Kind of like the pyramid idea of knowledge. They have a broad base, a l you know, a little bit, of, a lot of, you know, a little bit of th about a lot of things versus the, I know one thing and I know it very well. That's kind of the discipline mentality. I know one thing and I know it very well. Whereas the journeyman is the pyramid. I know a little bit about a lot of things. And so that's kind of where I see that branching off as far as the philosophical is concerned. And I like how the path is now just down to five ranks instead of 10 circles. Um, and so it kind of makes you, I can't say pick and choose more selectively, but it is more selective about what you can and can't do. Yeah. It does one thing that versatility, like it gets around one of the limitations of versatility. Versatility in fourth edition has been mm -hmm. tweaked so that it is a little bit more expensive to learn talents under it. Yeah. So that's to counteract a little bit the, the flexibility that having versatility as a talent grants is that it is a it's little bit more expensive. In addition to raising your versatility rank, you also yeah. need to pay a little extra, basically like one column up. If it's a novice talent, you pay for it as a journeyman and that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's not hugely more expensive, but there is a little bit of a cost on that. The path gets around that. Yeah. You learn talents the same way that you sort of do under versatility, and there are no talent options list to pick from. The talent options it's are still a smorgasbord. any talent, any talent, <laughs> any talent, any talent. Yes. I loved that entry. It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, it does restrict like you know, you can only learn novice talents from, from rank one to four or rank one and two, rank three and four, it's journeyman and rank five is warden. warden. Yeah. But there's none of that. It's all just, yeah, but they're, they're purchased as, well, actually looking at the cost, they are still purchased one rank up because it's mm -hmm. novice talents at rank one and two and they're purchased as journeyman. Yeah. Never mind all that I was just saying about getting around <laughs> the restrictions. Um, uh -huh. But uh, it, it, it adds even more slots for your character because these don't take up your normal versatility slots. Yeah. Well, and there's still the, and we'll get to them later on, which is, uh, Nax. So hold on, hold on to that thought. We'll get there at the end. Um, 
my favorite line out of the entire essay, which completely sums up the idea of the journeyman, is nobody loses their tricks just because I pick them up. That is perfect. If I could have written that myself, I'd have been very happy on my deathbed. Um, Because that is a fantastic line is, yeah, I'm borrowing what they know. They're teaching me what they know as well. And they're okay teaching me because... I'm spreading their legend and I'm making sure that they know I learned the Beastmaster way of doing this and the warrior way of doing that, the air sailor way of doing this over here. So yes, the journeyman borrows and is, it is the sincerest form of flattery, borrows all the talents that they would like to learn from everybody else. So uh, let's get down to the brass tacks. I think we've covered the philosophy en- enough and the evolution therefore enough. Let's get down to what you can and can't what you are going to learn and how you how you become an initiate in the path of the journeyman first off recruits seek out journeyers uh it's not journeymen who seek you out going hey maybe you should come join no you either feel this or you don't you either know that you just need to learn as much as you possibly can about everything that you possibly can and experience all that you possibly can or you don't and so if you don't you're not a journeyman and when you go through the interview process, you're interviewed by a rank five journeyer and they do a discussion and you have to display some of your talents and so forth and so on. And if you deceive them, you are barred from that path for life. You can't go in unearnestly thinking, yeah, I'm just going to grab some talents and, you know, be on my way. No, this is, this is a way of life. Like all paths are, if you don't assimilate this way of life into your current discipline, you're not going to be invited back in. Right. Now, the journeymen, generally speaking, are a very eclectic and iconoclastic group of path followers. They all are dedicated to the variety and the curiosity and the learning that is core to the journeyman as a path. Mm -hmm. But beyond sort of recognizing each other as followers of the same magical tradition – there's not a whole lot of hierarchy or that sort of thing. They are yeah. really Fast kind of moves. informally organized in that regard because each journeyman pursues their own desires and their own interests when it comes to what they pick up following the magic of their path. Yeah. And so it's it's just that sort of common experience and the idea of them all being open to different experiences and – different perspectives and being flexible in their day-to-day lives. Yeah. So is there a preferred discipline that matches best with the journeyman? No, nope. they're all welcome. That's kind of the point. <laughs> um, no, any, any, any human can become a journeyman. Uh, of course it's rank five. That's where you have to start, but that's how most things are for, for uh, that one. Can you be, uh, can you worship a passion? Can you be a quester? And still be a journeyman. Yes, again, all passions are welcome. They don't really have a problem with that. Again, it's the whole versatility thing. Um, but once you begin to focus on one passion, you kind of begin to lose your versatility outlook as far as becoming a quester. Right. The dedication and focus on one particular aspect of society and personality that is the hallmark of a strong devotee of a passion, especially a questor. Yeah. Runs counter to the flexible, semi freewheeling nature of the journeyman as a path. The, 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 the ever curious, ooh, what's that? Ooh, what's that? And are other paths allowed? Sure, you can follow another path. It, it, again, it's the whole versatility thing. But there's one exception it's the horror stalker, as usual. Horror stalkers are way too focused um, to be able to except all that other inputs and ideas and new things. So you can be any other path you want, just not a horror stalker and journeyman. Again, people are free to do what they want at their games and player characters are often exceptions. I am not a huge fan of the idea of loading out your character (laughs) with as many different paths and disciplines and so forth as possible in part because I don't think it's a particularly effective use of legend points. Yeah. Although, admittedly, once you get up into circles 9, 10, 11, or whatever in your primary discipline, and you're getting fairly sizable legend awards for things, assuming you're sort of following the normal scope, yeah, 
you may end up having a lot of spare legend points lying around, and you might find it more effective to just simply spend those points and learn another discipline mm -hmm. to get access to a whole bunch of new talents to spend those points on. Yeah. I'm just not super thrilled with the idea of burdening yourself <laughs> in that way. Uh, from a character development standpoint, there's a strong personality aspect to following a discipline and a path or a couple of disciplines or a discipline and a being a questor. It starts to get a little bit silly after a while. Yeah, fair enough. So when you are under your initiation and you've done your interview, your discussion, your display with the other uh, journeymen that are around you, your initiation ritual is kind of like all the other journeyers, fairly unique. It's not entirely standardized across the board because, again, they play kind of fast and loose and they're willing to take you in, see what you can do, and give you a personalized initiation ritual and the same thing kind of goes for your ordeals and your advancement. They're all a little unique per se, but they also, um, as you do your ordeals and gain your advancement, each one of those is supposed to be more providing you a broader perspective for each rank. You're going to continue to broaden your horizons, not narrow them because the journeyers journeymen are again, looking to experience as much as they possibly can take in as much as they possibly can, learn as much as they possibly can, and broaden themselves that way. So that's where the R-O-L-E playing comes into aligning yourself along this path. Yeah. One of the things that I that I want to, to mention as well, and this is brought up in the information, you know, talking about the initiation in the journeyman chapter. Yes. yes. And that is that humans who use versatility to in their own way, kind of focus more on their discipline. It talks about a warrior who picks up more combat talents under versatility mm -hmm. or a spellcaster who uses versatility to learn the thread weaving of other magician disciplines and thereby becomes more versatile, but also is still focused on spellcasting mm -hmm. might not be considered as suitable a candidate for becoming a journeyman because they, they are not diversifying themselves in the way that journeyman as a path sort of philosophically is dedicated to. Yeah. So that is something to keep in mind is, is that the magician, the, the wizard who has learned elementalism and nethermancy and illusion under their versatility, versatility. abilities yeah. in order to gain access to more spells is really just making themselves more of a spellcaster mm -hmm. rather than, Oh, well I'm going to pick up a little bit of, close combat ability from a sword master, maybe pick up some beast master abilities or pick some up thief. some other stuff here or yeah. there that might be interesting or useful in particular circumstances or whatever mm -hmm. um, neat tricks that I want to learn that do not necessarily need to necessitate me to follow a, an entirely new discipline. When you are finally into the journeyman uh, group pattern, your karma ritual modifies a little bit as well. And it's again, just um, adding different perspective and broadening your horizons with your current karma ritual on your discipline. So not anything major changing there, but yeah, the, the talents, this is the fun list because at rank one, it's any novice talent you want. And any novice talent you want and any novice talent you want. It just kind of goes on that way. Rank three, as Josh said, uh, any journeyman talent you want purchase at a warden tier and rank five is any warden talent you want purchase at a master tier or morphism, the one yes. dedicated talent. And we should probably talk about how morphism has changed from first edition to fourth, because now it's a whole, not to use a coy phrase, it's a whole different beast. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned back in the older days, Morphism was a talent where each rank in Morphism, as you advanced it, provided you a bonus to an attribute that was reflected by – it was reflective of one of the bonuses of – Yeah. Got the chart right there. The different name giver races. You would start off with like the plus one bonuses, uh, and then you'd kind of learn the plus twos and plus threes. And, and whatever the highest adjustment was for a particular attribute yep. was what you had. So eventually you kind of would add them all together, 
and have the best attribute modifiers for each of the attributes available. Yeah, at rank 13, it was a plus four toughness from Obsidian. At rank 14, it was plus four strength from Troll. And at rank 15, your highest available possible was rank strength. It was a plus six strength from the Obsidian. So it got way up there. But that's also in addition to the plus ones that you get to- Oh, totally. Perception, willpower, and charisma. Um, actually, I think you maybe even get a plus two to charisma. I think the Windlings in first edition got a plus two um, to charisma. It's possible. I don't remember. You are correct. Off the top of my head. Yeah, that was no. You were good. That was rank ten plus two charisma from Windlings. You don't really start getting the really big bonuses until you get pretty high yeah. in the the ranks on that. You end up with a lot of plus ones across the board. But again, mm-hmm. that still would be on top of whatever attribute advances you might have already purchased for the character. Yeah. But you had to have 15 ranks in Morphism to get there, so. In 4th edition, the change is a a little bit different. It still is based around the idea of providing you with attribute bonuses based on, you know, the attribute bonuses available to other name of races. But it's based on a test. The, The Adept actually makes a test, willpower plus their rank in Morphism against the target, the target being a member of another race. And if successful, they gain plus one to their attribute values per success for Mm -hmm. rank in minutes. And you just can't go higher than the difference between the human baseline and the bonus available to the race. So, for example, a journeyman uses morphism, targeting an elf with it, Mm-hmm. gains four successes and they can use those four successes on bonuses to dexterity perception willpower and charisma because those are the ones that elves get bonuses to yeah. but they can't get more than plus two to dex and plus one to each of the others respectively but they can distribute those four successes amongst those however they wish and it only lasts for minutes, right, minutes. yeah lasts for for effectively the the duration of an encounter mm-hmm. so it's not something that is a permanent bonus but it is something that allows the adept to kind of take the the nature of another name giver into themselves to express themselves uh, for a little bit. Yeah. But it's it's it is kind of scaled back, at least the default talent. There are some knacks, I think, that are available to it. Uh more I was gonna say, uh we should probably since the here's the here's the surprise part about the whole, hey Josh, let's talk about knacks. Depending upon whatever talent you pick up, you get the whole book at your disposal. That's because that's a long, <laughs> a long podcast to talk about all those knacks. So let's just focus on the morphism knacks because that's, yep. as we said, that's that was the one everybody wanted to get in first edition. And that's kind of where the epitome, uh, the apex of things are in fourth edition is the morphism knacks in the companion. So you have adaptive form, you've got divergent form, metamorphosis, quick shift, and versatile form. So there's at least five knacks there. So just kind of to to run through those real quickly, adaptive form allows the adept to spend successes from the morphism talent Mm -hmm. on things other than attribute bonuses. And it indicates the number of successes that are required to do it based on what you're trying to do. So for example... This gets you racial abilities. Yeah. These allow you access to racial abilities like the astral sight available to windlings. Mm -hmm. You can pick up Gahad as an orc. You can pick up the natural armor available to Obsidimen at two successes per point of armor. Yeah. You can get the rudimentary gills that Tuskrang have, allowing you to hold your breath for longer. Mm Mm-hmm. So, very cool. You have to target a name giver that has those abilities in order to learn them. By taking on, for example, the natural armor ability of the Obsidian, you also saddle yourself with the restriction that Obsidian have in it, their ability to wear non-living armors and so forth. Yeah. Cool. Then you have Divergent Form. This allows the journeyman to take on the appearance of another name giver race, but without gaining the abilities. So this is like the disguise self. Version. It's similar to it's similar to disguise self in that regard. Similarly sized name givers, elves, orcs, you can pass as without much trouble. You look a little bit unusual if you try and be like a dwarf um, or a troll because you don't take on the full uh, size of those yeah. individuals. You can't grow a tail, for example, with nope. that. 
It does not conceal your identity as all at all. So if no. you use this ability to appear as a an elf, everybody still recognizes you as who you were. You just look like an elf now. Yeah. So then there's metamorphosis, which is kind of... Metamorphosis is a more powerful version of divergent form. This actually mm-hmm. allows the adept to change their size in addition to appearing as the name giver race in question. Yeah. And you can grow the appendage you're looking for if you're going to be trying to be it's a strang. So... Yeah. This is at rank 10. This is a pretty <laughs> powerful ability. Yeah. Uh, you need to be pretty advanced in order to pick up this knack. Mm-hmm. It does allow you, like, for example, you could use this one to turn into a Tuscrang and actually have a tail and gain access to the tail attack ability that, that Tuscrang get, because that's connected to the ability to have a tail. Yeah. You know, you would get, if you changed into a Windling, you would get the bonus to physical defense because that's based on the fact that the Windlings are, are small. Mm-hmm. But the last the last paragraph of metamorphosis knack is the most important. Morphism can only target this race while this knack is active and all other ongoing morphism effects end. So you can only do metamorphosis. You can't combine it with divergent form and you can't combine it with more the other uh, adaptive form knack. And while that is in effect, you can't use versatility. You can't yeah. use any talents that you know under versatility. So it, it effectively, in a sense, turns you into that other race for mm-hmm. the duration of the knack, which can be handy, but is also a little bit of a drawback. Yeah, but it's a nice little story wrinkle. I'll say that. It's a nice little role-playing wrinkle to have in there. And then the last knack, sorry, second to last knack, is Quick Shift at rank six. This allows you to turn a morphism standard action into a simple action. Mm-hmm. So it just takes less time. Yeah. You could normally making those shifts with... um Divergent form or metamorphosis, those take standard actions. Does morphism itself? Uh, morphism itself is a standard action. So this allows you to do your morphism stuff as a simple action. And so you could be able to take on those bonuses and take an action that same round if yeah. you want. Fair enough. And then the last one is versatile form. This allows you to actually stack the effects of Uh, the morphism bonuses that you get. Mm -hmm. Normally, you can only gain the bonuses of one name giver race. And if you use it again while the duration is in effect, the new successes override the the previous ones. Yeah. Uh, Versatile form allows you to stack those effects at an increasing strain cost per additional that you are stacking. Yeah. So the first one costs two strain, the second costs four, etc. Yeah. Yeah, each additional use cost is two. So yeah, the second is six, third is eight, just kind of goes from there. So it's going to be your strain sponge. And you need to target different races on that. That's really the one where you start to see the kind of potentially ridiculous bonuses that you had from the old school (laughs) morphism. (laughs) Yeah, but it's going to cost you. That's the thing. It's going to cost you. What are your thoughts on on how the journeyman has developed from original editions to what it is now. I like the fact that all these different knacks have kind of yeah. branched out from what the morphism Actually, a is. couple of other knacks that we want to, that we should please, mention. Please, The journeyman knacks. Oh, yes. And that is, there are a series of knacks. There's applied versatility, practiced versatility, and skilled versatility. Mm. These allow the adept to spend karma They basically have to pay strain to spend karma on talents learned through versatility. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Rank one, rank three, rank five. So. Which kind of duplicates in their own way how the old school journeyman could spend, could learn, decide that a talent was a disciplined talent and and allow. Karma. Karma to be spent on it. One other thing actually that we didn't mention as Hmm. well. Yes. Unlike other paths, the journeyman does not get bonuses as they. Advance, advance in the ranks of a discipline. No, there is no... Because there is no unified thing... Nope. They don't get any defense bonuses. They don't get any other kind of stacks on their normal discipline abilities yeah. or bonuses for following a journeyman. But they have incredible versatility <laughs> in other ways. <laughs> I, say, there's, there's, I there's like the journeyman. The I like the essay. I like the philosophy that's kind of developed behind it and a way that sort of explains why they do what they do Mm -hmm. for those people who really like kind of cheesing out powerful talent combinations. 
There is still plenty of room to do that with a journeyman, but the worst excesses of that, especially when it comes to morphism, have been scaled back and and brought under a little bit of control. I really like the the journeyman. The the versatility talent of the human yes. is something that was kind of new to the idea of humans not being baseline with no special abilities. Yeah. You know, the idea being that, well, if you're going to be playing this, we're going to give you a little bonus as well. And the journeyman plays off that really, really nicely. They can be fun if you like having a diverse array of abilities mm -hmm. and you want to take advantage of the human versatility's option to making that possible, then this is a path that fits into that style very, very well. And much like the tail dancer from a couple of weeks ago, you're not necessarily making the game about anything yeah. by following the journeyman path. I mean, it's kind of a human thing, but unlike the woodsman, which has a lot of elven politics and so forth kind of wrapped up in it to a certain yeah. extent, this is the human thing and they can kind of fit in anywhere, which makes appropriate sense. Yeah. And I like that that the evolution thereof into fourth edition is not just the everything a thon, because I have ten circles of talents I can go pick up. No, you get five. You get five new talents at rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four, rank five. Be careful about your selection, but then you have all those knacks that go along with it. So Right, you've got those knacks, but it Yeah. Those five are in addition to oh, yeah. other talents that you may already have picked up under versatility. Totally. Because the other requirement, like you need to be a, a fifth circle character, you need to have your thread weaving at rank five. Yeah. You also need to have versatility at rank five. Yep. Which means that you've already got all of those talents that are available under there. Plus, you can continue to raise your versatility and learn things under that. Plus, mm -hmm. then you've got your path effective versatility ranks to pick up another five. So as a journeyman, you can end up with more talents than you would if you were just following versatility straight. Mm -hmm. The essay talks about why you might choose different abilities and stuff like that. You know, some people like to learn abilities from their fellow tardy was, members. Yeah. Uh, other people go, we've already got an archer. I don't really need to go and pick up archer stuff under versatility because we've got that covered. Mm -hmm. We don't have a thief. So I'm going to pick up a couple of useful thief talents to yeah. do stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it depends upon your philosophy as to who you want to learn from and what you want to learn. Just make sure that it's a nice broad horizon uh, because if you stagnate, you're done. The journeyman will cut you off. If you stop growing, if you stop learning, if you stop exploring, if you stop examining different perspectives and points of view, mm -hmm. then you are no longer adhering to the philosophical core of the journeyman as a path. Yeah. So, um, no, I like, I like how the journeyman turned out. The essay was fantastic. If I, I was read the first page and a half and said, I, if, if I had to write this, I would write the first page and a half the exact same way. So I applaud whoever wrote the essay did a fantastic uh, that job. That was Rusty. Rusty. Good job. I'm pretty sure that Rusty wrote the, the journeyman. Fair enough. It was exactly as I, I would have turned it out had I done it myself. So High, highest compliment I can give. I don't know if he takes that that way. Otherwise, folks, um, if you have any questions for us about your journeyman or your journey along with us on these 90 episodes that we have just now shot down, please feel free to email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Any final thoughts, Josh? Thank you again, everybody, for continuing to stay with us and to send us your emails and your interest and, and your suggestions and praise and all of that other stuff. Um, we are planning on continuing this for a little while longer and hope yeah. you continue to do so as well. We'll squeeze out every drop we possibly can. Until next time, folks, it's time for you to go diversify your legend. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>